His writings and interviews have appeared in magazines such as Nexus, UFO Magazine, Atlantis Rising, UFO Universe, uh, Dossier Sucre d'Etat, and on many websites such as Sotnet and Rents.com, to name a few. His five books include Underground Bases and Tunnels, What is the Government Trying to Hide, Kundalini Tales, Underwater and Underground Bases, Hidden in Plain Sight, Beyond the X-Files, and the Souter Report, Notes from the Underground. And, folks, I want to remind you, of course, that we have a call-in session. Uh, we're going to talk for an hour, and then after that, I'm sure there's going to be some questions that you may have yourself or some comments that you have for, for Richard. And if you want to feel, please feel free to call in. The number is there. Uh, it's 877-572-4270. All right. Uh, Dr. Souter, I can call you Richard, right? Absolutely. Welcome to the show. How are you? Well, thank you very much. I'm doing fine. I'm enjoying a wonderful evening here on the west coast of South America. I took a, a long walk on the beach earlier this afternoon and just looked at the surf, felt the sand in my feet, and reflected on the state of this planet and human race. Well, you're from, um, uh, you started off in Virginia, and then you were living in Texas for a while. How did you end up down where you are right now? Well, it's been a, a long journey, more than half a century. I was born in 1955 in Virginia and spent the first 20 years or so of my life, uh, most of the first 20 years of my life in Virginia. And since then, I've, I've lived, worked, studied, and traveled in many different states in the USA and also in um, many different countries and other parts of the world. Uh, I guess for a number for a number of years I was thinking about um, expatriating or leaving the United States. As time went by, I felt less and less comfortable in the country. I agreed less and less with so many of policies of the government, both domestic and foreign. I found I seemed to have less and less in common with um, more and more people in the country, and it got to the point point where I questioned why I remained. And so the day arrived when I decided to relocate to South America, initially for a vision quest. And indeed, I did have some visions in the process of undertaking my vision quest and many deep realizations which continue to this day. But I would say about three weeks into that process, after I arrived in South Amer America, I awoke one morning and uh, realized I'm not returning to the USA. I'm going to stay in South America. That's what I did uh, half a year ago, uh, more than half a year ago, and I feel very comfortable with that decision. Does it, is it, has it made a difference on you to be there in that perhaps you don't feel quite as close and up front to some of the policies and that you find offensive happening in, in this country? Yes, yes. I, I reached a point where I didn't even want to lend the appearance of support to what you might call the United States of America by my physical presence in that country. So I voted with my feet or maybe voted with my airline ticket would be another a better way to say it. And I, I got out of there. I scrammed. I um, just can't support the United States anymore. I disagree with the policies of the government. I find a very large percentage of the population are um, uh, essentially clueless, uh, bizarrely unconscious. Mm. And I, I reached the point where I no longer desired to associate with that type of person. And by the same token, I no longer wanted to lend even the appearance of support for the United States government by remaining in its territory. Are you still – are you – Touring or lecturing or, or going to conferences and stuff from where you live, from no, where you, you are? Know, no, you know I am very rarely invited to conferences, and were I be to uh, were, were I to be invited to speak at a conference in the United States of America or in, in any territory that it controlled, um, I would not attend. Um, I, but no, I'm. It's a moot, moot issue anyway because they don't ask me. So since they don't ask me, I won't be attending anywhere. Um, anyway, anywhere. 
uh, I do uh, give many interviews um, when and if people ask, and I want to thank you for asking me for an interview. I'm delighted to be here. Not a problem. I mean, I, I'm certainly familiar with, with uh, some of your work, at least, and I personally feel, and, and I think the producer does as well, that, you know, it's just important to get as much information out there to people as possible. There's so few avenues for people to really hear um, what's going on, and, and admittedly, most people really will probably pay half an ear, but, you know, maybe just if a little information falls on the wayside and, and it goes in and it, it stays there, maybe somewhere down the road something will happen that will corroborate that and they'll begin to put something together for themselves, you know. Um, uh, some, of, some of them will, some of them will, David, but frankly, there's a very large percentage of the American people. I couldn't give you a precise figure other than to say millions and millions and millions who are walking into the events that are coming like uh, as if they were walking forehead first into a, a giant rapidly rotating buzz saw at a lumber yard. They are so unaware, so unconscious, so propagandized, and many of them very smugly and happily so, that they will get the rudest awakening that they could have ever made, imagined. Now, it wouldn't need to be so. People are unconscious, propagandized, and unaware because at every turn they have elected not to awaken, they have elected not to see, they have decided not to understand, they have made a conscious decision not to pursue understanding. In fact, many people have, have assiduously avoided being aware and being conscious. However, we are reaching the point where events will force themselves on people, on pe into people's awareness, whether or not they like it, whether or not they feel they are ready. The very fact that they have refused to be ready, that they have refused to be aware, will bring these events front and center in their lives, and they will be confronted with what they ha have gone out of their way to not see to not understand for decades. Well, you know, I think there's a lot of truth in that. And I know, for instance, a friend of mine was telling me, we were having a discussion somewhat about this the other day, and he was saying that a member of his family, his brother, says to him, well, you know, America, you know, love it or leave it. If you don't like it, leave it. So well, I left um, it. you left it. Well, I left it. <laughs> yeah. I got to the point where, you know, one too many persons said that to me. Well, why are you here? If you don't like America, why are you here anyway? And, you know, I thought to myself, yeah, why the hell am I here? I think I'll leave because I'm really sick and tired of that of that opinion. And by the way, those people who love America so much are about to find out exactly what America really is and has been for a long time because America is getting ready to bear its fangs. Well, you know, I had a friend of mine say to me, too, also, he said, well, you know, if my president says it is good enough for me, I'm not friends with that person anymore, by the way, because I I couldn't wrap my mind around that particular perspective. Um, I think people are beginning to wake up a little bit, though. I mean, the Gulf, the Gulf. I'm going to say the Gulf War, but the, uh, the the Gulf of Mexico and everything that happened down there over the last year. Um, we don't hear a lot about it on the news anymore, uh, and we never really heard a lot of the, what was really going on. Um, but people really began to speak out a little bit down there, um, and they probably still are. We just don't really hear about it. No, the mainstream news media have gone silent for the most part on the on the problems in the Gulf of Mexico, which are ongoing. They are extremely severe. They are absolutely hazardous to human life, to marine uh, marine organisms across the board, from the you know from the plankton all up all the way up to the whales and the porpoises and every stage in between. Um, it is, it is, it's damaged the hydrology of the Gulf of Mexico. The, the corexic chemicals that have been sprayed in the water, the petroleum itself, uh, have altered the, the chemical nature of the water such that the Gulf current does not flow the same way that it has for essentially many thousands of years. That has created um, a catastrophic change in hydrology of the Gulf of Mexico and the North Atlantic. That, in turn... Uh, has altered the climate, and, and my understanding is that um, 
there are going there's going to be hell to pay. Um, not only for the for the marine ecology, which is already reeling. Forget what BP says. Forget what the uh, USA government federal agencies say. They're liars. They're all headed straight to hell. They're just psychopathic liars from hell. So forget what they say or don't say, because because they wouldn't know the truth mm -hmm. if it came up to them and bit them on the nose. Mm -hmm. The truth is not in them. But the reality is that this has affected hydrology and and through the hydrology, the climate, it's affected the marine life. The the you know, uh, the, the the cork is off of of the bottle. Uh, the the genie is out. The lid of Pandora's box is open, and uh, what is broken cannot and will not be fixed. So that situation will be festering for years, decades, maybe centuries to come. Well, you know, I mean, I certainly, when it first happened, I mean, I was, I almost got sick to my stomach and I got so angry. I was furious um, because I could just sense that uh, this was a major uh, shift, a major turn in, of events uh, for this country in, in many, many ways. And now, you know, I'm, you know, after a while, you, you know, everybody, everybody turns their back and goes back to their work and, and you just. You, you, you kind of forget about it. You know, I feel a little badly even for, from, the, from my perspective because at some point there's, there's so many other things that, that start happening around the world. It's like, well, where do you, uh, you know, you, you can't focus on one thing but for so long before something else gets, you know, gets somebody's, it gets one's attention. Yes, and that, that was uh, the so-called British Petroleum accident last spring was not really an accident, and that has to be understood. British Petroleum knew well before the rig blew out that there was a high probability that it would. They knew that the pressures down there were phenomenally high. They knew that they were drilling into an extremely high pressure, very gassy um, petroleum uh, uh, stratum. And they were warned by their own engineers that uh, a catastrophic blowout was more than likely if they continued. And yet they continued to the point where it did happen and the whole thing exploded in their faces, literally. Uh, so that was no accident. British Petroleum had plenty of warning signs and plenty of warnings uh, well before the disastrous blowout occurred, and still they continued. So the only possible conclusion is that uh, uh, they achieved the desired result, and what they did was done intentionally and with full knowledge of what was likely to occur. I must say that with the Fukushima um, nuclear reactor catastrophe in Japan, which, like the Gulf disaster, is also ongoing, uh, people say, well, that was an accident. Uh, there was no way to foresee that. Well, in fact, there were plenty of ways to foresee that, and there were people who did foresee that what happened could, hap could happen and, and probably would, given enough time. Number one. The reactors were built directly on the coast of the Pacific Ocean, literally a stone's throw from the surf. Number two, the reactors were built in a coastal region with a known history of major earthquakes and tsunamis going back centuries, even thousands of years. Number three, the reactors had a flawed design from the standpoint of safety, and it was known to be flawed for decades. Number four, a great quantity of of um, of um, radioactive fuel depleted uh, fuel rods were stored on the site. Years and years, even decades worth of, of radioactive fuel rods were stored there. Um, number you know, and, and, and number five, there had been previous problems there. Uh, TEPCO had a history of uh, safety violations. So you add all that they covered up, both TEPCO and the Japanese government. Mm -hmm. So you add all those five elements together, you stir well, and what you have, you have a nuclear disaster in the, in the making, which, sure enough, did occur. So I would say there's another example of a planetary kill shot, uh, an enormous a so-called industrial accident that was actually, upon closer examination, not so accidental at all, as many people have presumed. In fact, the so-called accident but was foreseen by people with clear vision uh, many, many years ago. Do you think so, that this was a, a, a man-made, was this weather, weather warfare perhaps? 
I, I don't know about that. There's been a lot of speculation about HARP being used to trigger that earthquake fault and, and that type of thing. I don't know about that. What I can say is the uh, Japanese islands have a history of earthquakes. Uh, there, you know, I, I believe Japan is one of or perhaps the most earthquake-prone region on the planet. So uh, HARP aside, that entire region is well known to, to suffer from earthquakes, including major ones. So it's no surprise that there was a major earthquake in Japan. Uh, so I don't even need think you need to bring HARP into the discussion. I don't know if it was involved or not, or some kind of weather warfare was involved. If it was, okay, it was. If it wasn't, in and of itself, the region is known to be extremely seismically active, and it was only a matter of time until a major earthquake occurred. Well, one did occur with catastrophic results. Let's go back to the Gulf of Mexico for a minute. Is there an underwater base there? Yeah. Uh, my, my information indicates there's not just one underground base there, but likely multiple underground bases there, um, both human-built bases, and by humans I mean most likely North American humans, meaning by Fortune 500 companies and alphabet soup agencies, including the milita United States military agencies, but also um, extraterrestrial underwater facilities. Uh, from, from what I've been told and what I surmise, from all of my research, I would I would um, say that it's uh, stronger likely that you find both terrestrial and extraterrestrial facilities beneath the Gulf of Mexico. So all of this about how deep it was and how difficult it was to contain the leak and all all of that's just that's just smoke then, because obviously if they had bases that far down, then it would have been any problem. There would have been no problem for them to have stopped that supposed leak in a short period of time. Well, yes and no. Um, you have to understand the geology of the Gulf of Mexico is such that in, there, there are hundreds of perhaps thousands of uh, salt domes on the floor of the Gulf of Mexico, uh, starting at about southern Mississippi, going around off the coast of Louisiana, Texas, and then continuing, continuing right, down, right down off of some regions of Mexico. Uh, and some areas of the Gulf have these um, geological conditions where indeed you do have very high pressure uh, deposits of petrochemicals uh, down beneath the seafloor, including um, natural gas under very high pressure. Uh, but other areas have a different geology. So in some areas, you could drill down beneath the seafloor and make uh, undersea bases, even into some parts of the salt domes. Uh, salt, for example, is a very good, very easily um, excavated and tunneled um, mineral. So you can easily excavate rock salt to make a, a deep undersea facility if you want to. You could also do it in limestone. There's quite a lot of limestone underlaying the Gulf of Mexico. However, if you drill, um, my God, how, how deep down was with BP? I've read different figures, you know, five or six miles. Mm -hmm. And they, they, they drilled right into a very high-pressure petrochemical deposit. So they were asking for it. In that case, um, they went looking for trouble, and they found it. Um, these bases, let's talk a little bit about the bases. There's so much to, to, to talk about, but let's take on the underwater bases for a little bit. How, say, the, according to your research and, and, and the knowledge that you, you've turned up, how large would the largest of these bases be? My research says that the largest ones would be able to accommodate large military um, deep diving submarines. Now, large military submarines are hundreds of feet long, three, four, five. I think the biggest ones are close to 600 or more feet long. And they'll be anywhere from 40 to upwards of 100 feet from the bottom of the keel to the top of the conning tower. And, and then they'll have a crew ranging anywhere from 80 to 150 men 
so these are very large vessels, and I have documentation showing that already back in the mid-1960s, the United States Navy was uh, heavily involved in research and design work for deep undersea bases that would accommodate uh, three, four, five, six uh, large um, ocean-going military submarines and their crews at a very great depth down in the bedrock beneath the seafloor in mid-ocean. So they can be quite large. From the military documentation I saw, they were planning to make quite large facilities that would accommodate hundreds hundreds of personnel and all the equipment and facilities that they would need. That's amazing. So they actually pretty much probably accomplished that within the next mm, 10, 15 years then. Mike, yes, um, I think they have. Um, from everything that I've been told, that I've read, that I've researched, and that I've surmised from filling in the, you know, the blanks, uh, it does appear they've done that. And essentially we have the open military that we see and know about, and then we have the clandestine services that we don't see and that we know very little about. Um, some some idea as to the size and to the importance of these clandestine organizations, military and also non-military, can be got, and you can get some idea of that by, by looking at the trillions of dollars that have been siphoned off into the black budget. And, and, and a number of researchers have done good work on that. Catherine Austin, Austin Fitz at Solari.com, S-O-L-A-R-I.com, has done some work on that, as have others. And just tens and hundreds of billions of dollars, even trillions of dollars, have been sucked out of the the budget and into the black world into these top secret programs that don't see the light of day. So um, my research and, and that of others uh, strongly indicates that the workings of these projects are just huge, that thousands maybe hundreds of thousands of people are involved in these programs with top secret, uh, highly compartmentalized clearances, and that um, trillions of dollars have been lavished on them. It's like a parallel reality. We live in a bizarre world where there's a parallel or secret civilization that's extremely secretive, extremely well-financed, has access to science fiction like uh, cutting edge high technology and has access to secret facilities and personnel um, that are kept hidden from us and yet all of this exists. It's like a parallel world that shares this planet with us. It's bizarre beyond description and yet that is the reality that's come into focus for me after 20 years of research. You know, I, I know that most people would, you know, listen to what you're saying now and they would just shake their heads and, and return to, to their television show or, you know, flick the paper and, and go back to page two or something. Um, it, it's kind of hard to really to expect people to wrap their minds around something so extraordinary. You know, most most people don't. And all I can say is, if you want some documentation on what I'm talking about, um, go to my blog site at eventhorizonchronicle.blogspot.com. That's eventhorizonchronicle.blogspot.com. I have a banner right at the top of the of the um, of my blog. You click on that; it'll take you to my books. You read my books, you start to open, understand the scales will begin to fall from your eyes. Um, but I assure you, I spent a lot of time, years, a couple of decades, researching many of these questions in great depth, talking to just scores of people, um, some of them extremely knowledgeable. And Did you get, did ever get to talk to anybody that actually was, on, was in one of these underground Basically. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. In mm-hmm. fact, uh, just a couple of my, of month, uh, a couple of years ago, um, I'll give you one example. Multiple such individuals, but this this one individual contacted me out of the blue and said he wanted to talk to me. So we did talk at length on telephone, and um, 
I was thoroughly persuaded of his bona fides, and he, the way he started was by telling me, you know, um, the secret underground bases are real. There are many of them, and thousands of people work in them. Well, I already knew this, but it was nice to hear it from him. Mm -hmm. And he went on to describe, uh, you know, a couple of bases that I knew about and then told me about some others I didn't. Um, I can I can only tell you that they are deep, they are vast. Let me say that again. They are very deep, they are vast. And they are equipped with such advanced cutting-edge technology that it's like science fiction. It's it's far beyond what we have in our everyday world here on the top top side. And and, and then there are thousands of people working in these places that don't talk about where they go, what they see, what they know, or what they do. They have families. They have children. They have houses. They have cars. You pass them on the highway. Mm. You pass them on the highway. You, 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 you stand in line with them at the grocery store checkout, and you have no idea who these people are, where they go, what they know, what they do. I, mm -hmm. I, repeat, I repeat, I say again. There is a parallel society on this planet that exists side by side with the everyday society that the vast majority of us are most familiar with. And this thing has been with us for years and years. Would, the, would these bases, would you say that every major city um, has an underground, uh, has, 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 a, has a, say, a shadow city underneath it? Well, yeah, most major cities do, absolutely. Whether you're talking about a city like New York City or or Kansas City or, or I don't know, London, Paris, Moscow, um, uh, Beijing, uh, Tokyo, yeah. Virtually all, Rome would be another one, virtually all major cities um, have an extensive underground Component. This is just the way it is. In fact, um, Washington, D.C. would be another example. Um, these cities have uh, multiple levels. Starting at, at the street level, you go down. The first level down would be um, utility tunnels for steam, uh, for phone lines, fiber optic cables, sewer lines, water lines, that kind of thing. These would be the ones that are accessed with manholes. When you drive through a major city, you see just hundreds and thousands, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of manholes. Mm. And the manholes give access to this like rat-like maze, a warren of tunnels that are just under the, under the streets. Every city has these. Now, below that, you go down to the next level, and in most large cities, you would have some kind of uh, under, underground um, mass transit system called a metro or a subway, something like that. And this would be true in London and Paris, Washington, D.C., New York, Moscow, um, Tokyo, many, many cities this would be the case. Now, Paris would be another example. Then the next level down, you start getting into the more secret things, the, the deep basements. For example, if you've ever been in a major, uh, a very large building in a major city, you get an elevator, and you'll see buttons going up and up and up for 20, 30, 40, 50 floors. Right. And you'll also see, you'll also see, also see a bunch of them below the ground level that will go down, in some cases, you know, four, five, six, seven levels. Uh, and, and then sometimes you'll see a key, you know, places to put a couple of keys and some other buttons. That takes you down to the more secure levels where the general public under no circumstances would go. Mm -hmm. and, and then from those levels, you would have access to still lower levels. Now, we use the example of Washington, D.C. In one of my re two most recent books um, called Hidden in Plain Sight, Beyond the X-Files, which was published last year and which can be accessed through my blog site at eventhorizonchronicle.blogspot.com. Um, in that book, I describe how Already back in 1963, there were plans, there was active planning at the highest levels 
of the United States government to build a deep underground base beneath Washington, D.C., um, uh, three-fifths of a mile underground. They wanted to go um, 3,500 feet underground for this thing. Mm. And it was called the, um, the, the Duke, Deep Underground Command Center. And um, I found the documents for this in the Lyndon Baines Johnson um, Presidential Library in Austin, Texas, which is on the grounds of the University of, of Texas at Austin. And I did some archival research there and found these documents. Another researcher had tipped me off to their existence. I went looking for them, and sure enough, there, there they were. So I found memoranda from the very highest levels of the Kennedy White House of starting just a couple of weeks before he had his brains blown out in Dallas. Um, but the planning went on in the new Lyndon, Lyndon Johnson administration moving into early 1964. So um, they were going to have high-speed elevators that would give access from the White House, from the State Department, and from the Pentagon that would go down um, to 3,500 feet underground below Washington, D.C. And then there would be um, shuttle trains down there, uh, deep underground that would run from the elevators uh, to wherever the underground um, base was put, and I I give um, documentation in that book, book uh, to demonstrate what I believe that base was probably built, and why why it was probably enlarged um, several years ago, uh, and during the Bush Cheney administration. Now, do you think that's what Cheney believe, was hiding during uh, 9/11? He was hiding out somewhere. Nobody could seem to find him for a while. Sure, Maybe sure. he took the elevator down. Sure, I, I do think it was uh, where he was, and I also believe that during the time Cheney was was living in the vice president's residence, which is on the grounds of the of the United States Naval Observatory in Northwest Washington D.C., I believe another high-speed elevator shaft giving access to the deep underground level beneath Washington, D.C., was installed at the vice president's residence for Cheney's personal use. Um, and, yeah, yeah, so I believe he was down there. And as a matter of fact, um, uh, one of my good friends who unfortunately passed away um, last winter was, um, not this past winter, but the winter before, uh, was a, a native of Washington, D.C., and graduated um, from college there back in the 60s. She took an entry-level job uh, with the Department of Housing and Urban Development and um, had two very peculiar experiences not long after she went to work there. She was in an entry-level clerical position, mm -hmm. at, working at her desk one day when she was approached by two men in suits and ties who asked her by name and said um, that they were from the Secret Service. Now, this greatly took her aback uh, because she wondered why in the world they had come to her workplace to talk to her. They handed her some documents and told her that she was to leave her desk, travel across town to the White House, and deliver them to the White House. Uh, she thought this was very peculiar, but since these two government agents were asking her to do this, she complied. She left her workstation, left HUD, went across town to the White House, walked up to the guard station and said, you know, I'm so-and-so, I'm from HUD. I was told to deliver these documents to the White House. And the Secret Service agents in the guard station said, yes, thank you, we've been expecting you. You can deliver the documents to us. We appreciate it and you can return to your work. So she did, with her head whirling, wondering what in the world is going on. She never heard anything more about it. Well, some time went by, and one day um, two more Secret Service agents appeared at her workplace and said, um, would you come with us? And she said, well, um, why? And they said, well, we want you to deliver these documents to the White House. And they gave her some documents. Mm -hmm. Well, 
agency again thought this was very peculiar. Why wouldn't they just take the documents to the White House themselves? But for whatever reason, they wanted her to deliver these documents to the White House. So she said, okay. She went across town with them. They got to the guardhouse at the White House, and she thought, well, I'll just hand them hand the documents over and return to work as I did before. But no. Mm-hmm. They went through the, through the checkpoint, the Secret Service checkpoint there at the gate. They went up the driveway to the White House and through the door and into the White House. At this point, she was just... Um, Stupefied, she had no idea what was going on. She was taken to into a wing of the White House where the public never goes, and there was a, an elevator there. The elevator doors opened. She got into the elevator with the Secret Service agents, and the doors closed, and they went down. She remembers them going 17 levels straight down beneath the White House. This, this, mind you, was in. Uh, the mid-1960s, while Lyndon mm-hmm. Johnson was president. And they went down, she remembers, 17 levels. The doors opened, and she saw a corridor stretching away, way straight away from her into the distance to the vanishing point. My goodness. Yes, it was tiled. The, the, the floor, the walls, and the ceiling were all tile, ceramic tile, and there was recessed lighting in the ceiling. There were other corridors and doors opening off of this one corridor that stretched into the distance to the vanishing point. And all up and down its length, there were other doors and corridors branching off from it. Well, they walked down the corridor a little ways till they came to one of the doors. Uh, they opened the door and they went in. She was a, there was a man in a suit and a tie sitting behind a desk there. She was instructed by the Secret Service agents to give the documents to this man which she did. Upon having done that, uh, they left that office, closed the door, went back down the corridor, uh, got back on the elevator, went went up, 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 back into the White House. She was escorted off the elevator into the White House, out of the White House, down the White House drive, through the Secret Service checkpoint and told, thank you very much, ma'am. You may return to your workstation at HUD. She never had any explanation for that, never knew why that happened. She was always puzzled. Uh, No one ever gave her any answer whatsoever for that. And I know from my research there absolutely is a large, a very deep, sophisticated facility beneath the White House. And there are other tunnels and facilities beneath official Washington, D.C. as well. You have to understand, when you go to Washington, D.C., just as when you go to other major cities, when you drive around and you look at all the big buildings and the traffic and the thick throngs of people on the sidewalk, that's one world. It's a very real world. There is another world deep beneath your feet you never see. It is also a very real world, but it is out of sight and out of mind. Now, they never approached her again, ever, or to that, never? No. No. That that sounds so highly peculiar. It is, and and this this is what happens when you get into this realm. It is a realm of vast strangeness. Uh, The technology that is used in many of these facilities is not ordinary technology. The programs and projects that are carried out in many of these facilities are not ordinary projects and programs. That is why they are carried out deep underground under a veil of extreme compartmentalized top secrecy. What are some of the things that you think are going on down there or that you're, uh, if you can divulge a little bit of that perhaps? Yes, I can tell you some of the things I do know and then I can tell you some of the things that I think are very likely. Okay. I do know I do know that there are weapons stored underground, both conventional and nuclear weapons. I do know that there's cutting edge uh, scientific research that takes place underground. I do know that there are massive uh extremely sophisticated supercomputing facilities underground. 
Um, I do know that there are military command, control, and communication facilities underground. I do know that there are doom, so-called doomsday survival bunkers and facilities underground, which you might call arcs. Mm-hmm. Um, I do know that there are um, storage facilities for our, uh, data archives and, and document archives. Um, I know that there are um, under under mines, of course, uh, many mines uh, for precious metals and also for base metals and also for a variety of minerals that exist underground. Uh, and I also know that there are underground industrial facilities, uh, including warehousing and light, and light industry facilities. I know that there are administrative, governmental administrative and bureaucratic facilities underground, both military and non-military agencies. I know that there are power generation facilities underground. Uh, So we know quite a few of the things that are underground. Now, other types of things that we know are underground are um, secret uh, research and design, cutting edge research and design, aerospace, for example, facilities such as at the Lockheed Skunk Works in California or at Area 51 in Nevada, that type of thing. Does, did, did any of this underground research, because I didn't, um, I, don't, I don't know if you covered it in your book, does any of this include what's happening in Dulce at all? No, I think Dulce is, um, is um, uh, a dead end. I think that's propaganda, basically. Um, insofar as the specific geographic vicinity of the, of the town of Dulce on the Hikaria Apache Indian Reservation, uh, just south of the, the border, the Colorado and New Mexico border. Mm-hmm. I think that is propaganda designed to deflect serious scrutiny and research from other places where real major underground facilities do exist. Okay. Um, I've, I've never seen hard incontrovertible proof of an underground facility at Dulce. Now, there are people out there on the lecture circuit saying it's real and trying to sell books and things, but none of them have hard documented proof, not one of them. Um, but, nevertheless, I, you do feel that there is, the thing, what they're describing of Dulce with the deep underground bases, the different levels. There. Only it's not at Dulce. Okay. It's okay. somewhere else. Okay. It's somewhere else, perhaps at Los Alamos, or nearby to Los Alamos, but it's not right at the small town of Dulce, or not within one or two miles of there. Um, but there certainly are secret underground bases, no question. And I give the documentation for that, for for, for my saying that, in in my book, Hidden in Plain Sight, Beyond the X Files, uh, which is also available at Amazon.com. Hidden in Plain Sight. Beyond the X Files. That's that's your newest. Uh, is that that's well, that's your newest yeah, book. That's my not? newest. That's my my newest underground and un, underwater basis book. I also have another one entitled The Richard Souter Briefing, which is just what it says. It's a briefing book. It's a brief book, and it has to do with not only this period of time, but also the many many cover ups that that are operating on this planet. Historical cover ups, um, political cover ups. Economic cover-ups, technology cover-ups, the cover-up on 9/11. You name it. We're we're deep in the weeds. The lies in every area are so thick you could just slice them. That's thick and goopy like butter. You could slice them with a butter knife. Yeah, the rabbit hole goes down deep. When did uh, let's go back to the beginning for a minute, Richard? Um, And your your uh, recount your tale for us um, or your experience I prefer to say with the bone lady because this happened when you were a, what a child right um, and, oh, and I was, it, I it was changed your life old. it altered your it all it, well, it set you off in a direction um, that's such it, a young it, age it, to have that kind of an experience absolutely it's it's a, a profound formative experience and you're right it, it definitely had a huge impact on my life and contributed massively uh, to who I am and, and the kind of research I do and the, and the sort of things I do and say and think. Um, 
I'm a man like everyone else, but I'm also not a man like everyone else because of, of the bone lady. I, uh, and um, she appeared on the on the roof of the family home when I was three years old on one spring day. It was in 1958. I was a sickly little boy. I was three years old. And the bone lady appeared on the roof of the house, and um, she downloaded a lot of information to me. I've never been the same, same since. I was just um, dumbstruck in a sense. She has the most singular gaze of any of any entity I've ever encountered, human or non-human. I couldn't tell you exactly who the bone lady is, except that she is one heavy-duty personage. What, uh, um, she, how did she get the name? I called her the bone lady. Okay. Uh, my mother, my mother saw me walking around the front yard, looking at the at the roof of the house, uh, muttering to myself and 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 making a gesture. You know, you know the kind of 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 um, of mudra that that yogis make with their hands and their fingers when they meditate in the lotus posture. Mm -hmm. um, I was doing this with my fingers mm -hmm. uh, at the age of three, walking around in the front yard, looking at the house, roof of the house, and muttering to myself. My mother looked out the, the, the front window at me, and she, she understood immediately that something had happened to me and uh, that was unusual. She went out to talk to me, and I just kept um, – telling her over and over again about the bone lady. The bone lady's on the roof of the house. The bone lady, mommy. The bone lady, mommy. Mommy, the bone lady was up on the roof of the house. And so I, at the age of three, called her the bone lady. Um, I, I, of course, that was 53 years ago. I don't have a crystal clear photographic uh, image in my mind anymore of exactly what she looked like. But I can tell you the lingering impression is of a tall, gaunt, um, um, skeletal, thin, bony type of figure in a long, dark, flowing garment of some kind uh, of, of, who struck me as being a female entity because mm -hmm. I called her a lady. And, of course, bone lady speaks for itself. Um, I don't know who or what exactly she was, but, buddy, she was alive and, and far more so than... <laughs> Than any human being I've ever encountered, she is a deep, deep, deeply conscious entity. And she, you said that you, she actually downloaded, and this must have been a, yeah. she must have happened in a very short period, say 15, 20 minutes or something. She was just yeah, yeah, I would inputting say, information. I would say it was a period of minutes, yeah, such that I always knew that this time of great global turmoil and darkness was coming. And I always knew that from, from a young age which immediately set me apart. Imagine if you were a little kid. At the same time, you're playing with all the other, other, other little children. In the back of your mind, you know, yes, but, by the way, down the road, this just unspeakably uh, dark era or period is just going to whip saw the earth and humanity. Suppose you always knew that from early childhood on. Well, I'm one of those people who have. And... I guess it's one of the reasons I've gone out on nuclear missile silos three times in my life, in Arkansas, in Missouri, and most recently last year in North Dakota. And go, I went right over the security fence onto the missile silos and staged um, nonviolent peace demonstrations to say, with my personal presence, you know, listen, we don't want to do this. We don't have to do this. It's a bad idea not only to do this, but to prepare to do this, because you know what? Sometimes when you prepare to do things, you end up doing them. In fact, that's often the case. So well, I three times, three times have done that, and and you know you can virtually count on the fingers of your hands the number of people in American society who have. It's a, it's an extremely small percentage of humanity who have gone to these nuclear missile silos and said, you know what? This is a bad idea. Let's not do it. And I'm one of those people. Well, I have to say, I mean, that's a really quite a brazen action to take. Um, and, and I saw, I saw you know the what? picture. You know yeah. what? You know what? It, and because so many other people haven't, we're skating on the edge of nuclear war, David. 
Now, do, do you know? Let's, let me. Do you think that that could really happen? And I, this is why I'm going to say this because it already has, David. It already has. The United States has already dropped nuclear weapons twice on other cities, Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Well, so right. don't ask yeah. me. If, don't ask me if I think it can happen because I'll tell you, not only can it happen, it has happened, and the United States is the country that made it happen. So there's your precedent right there. Would, well, would the United States military actually incinerate? Other cities, yes, they would because they have. Well, yes, they have, and, and yes, I, I, I was wasn't including those two cities actually. Um, well, you have to, you yeah, have to, yeah, because I, that's, that's the precedent right there. The United, the Pentagon, absolutely will kill people in large numbers with nuclear hell because they've done it before. Well, some of the things that you know, some other people that I've talked to and. You know, both on this show and of other things that I've read, and this is why I asked the question the way that I did, um, have sort of put out there that uh, extraterrestrials that are involved in watching over the planet, um, allowing us to reach a certain point through our own free will, have sort of, um, sort of, how can I put it, uh, put, are putting a great deal of energy into making sure that there are no more nuclear catastrophes on the planet because that would affect well, you, the free will of stop, the people. Let me stop you. Let me stop you right there. Those extraterrestrials did not stop the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. They didn't stop the several hundreds of nuclear explosions in Nevada, in New Mexico, um, up in Alaska. Now, the Russians also had many nuclear tests. So did the Chinese and the French and the English. And they, had, they didn't stop any of that. They didn't stop the reactor at Chernobyl in, in Ukraine from blowing up back in 1987. They didn't stop the, the reactors at Fukushima from blowing up. Three of them have melted down. They didn't stop any of that. So people who say, well, the, the extraterrestrials will prevent nuclear disasters from happening, well, they haven't so far. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's so you're simply saying that it's up to us. That's, then. that's wishful thinking. That's wishful thinking because the historical example clearly shows uh, time and time again, um, even when it comes to incinerating entire cities with nuclear weapons, the extraterrestrials didn't stop that. Okay, so you you um like I said, you decided to. I think we're on our own. David, let me say, okay. I'm, I'm going to tell you, we are on our own, and we will have to clean up our own act. I think the grown-ups are all around us. I think they're in orbit right now watching us, and their attitude is, you know what? It's your mess. You have to clean it up. It's not our mess. It's your mess. It's your planet. Either you fix it or you don't. Mm -hmm. It's grown-up grown time, David. Mm-hmm. Well, I certainly understand where you're coming from, and I understand why that motivated you to actually cross the fence there you know at, at the Minot you know what? what? Do you know what? Either you take action or you don't. Either you are an autonomous human being who stands up and takes personal responsibility for what's happening on your planet. I took personal responsibility. I went right to the nucle nuclear missile silos and over the fence and said, you know what? I don't give a flying fig what the president thinks. Because I'm going to declare what I think. I'm going to declare my position unilaterally. My unilateral position is I don't agree. I'm voting against it. I'm opposed. And I'm going right to the scene of the crime to deliver my message in person. Well, I have to say, man, that's really very brave of you. And I just want to say to you folks that are listening other people right now. Have to do it. If other people, it's up to other people. Listen. These problems will only go away, only go away, when by the millions other people start doing what I've done. Because you know what? If you don't do it, it doesn't get done, period. That's the only way. Only when the human race individually, by the millions, starts standing up to be counted. Only then do things change. Because just sitting behind your computer terminal, blogging and listening to podcasts, what's that? That's nothing. That's passive. That's avoidance. You need to physically put your life on the line. Wow. Well, that's pretty deep. That's pretty deep right there, Richard. Um, folks, no, I just want to sure. That's grown up. That's yeah. what grown ups do. Well, that's that is grown ups. Yeah. That is what grown ups do. Uh, folks, feel free to call in. Um, the number is 877 572 4270. That's 877 572 
four two seven zero, and it is toll free. Um, you can make your comments uh, and, and talk to Richard and um, ask him any questions that you might want. He uh, has a, uh, a great deal of information um, to share with you about not just the underground tunnels and bases, but other paranormal um, uh, phenomena as well. Um, so, so you 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 created the um, I guess it's Minot Manifesto and Minot, you, Minot. the Minot the Minot, Minot Manifesto. And you yes. crossed over the fence, which was with barbed wire, et cetera, and you took some white roses and crystals and yarn, a, yes. a, a coin, and you left all of this at the side. Did you get to leave that stuff, or did they pick it up and take it away? Oh, they took all of it. The FBI confiscated everything, uh, including my feathered headdress with the crystals and the and the feathers, which I t- took a long time to make, and all of the the components cost me about $400 to make that, and so all of that was confiscated by the FBI. I, I don't have it anymore. Did you not think that that would happen? How did yes. You, what, you, you, you yes. did think it would happen. I knew it would happen because these people are thieves, David. Yeah. The so American you... American government agents are thieves, and they are shaking down the American people right now. There's great crime and process the American people are being robbed blind. That's the end of the discussion right there. The American people are the victim of a national mugging. But you know what? I guess it's okay because I don't see many people speaking out and protesting. Most people are just taking it, are just quietly taking it. And that's why I decided to leave. I looked around and it seemed like what was going on was okay with the majority of the people in the country. I, so I, most, I, the point. I don't think I people, the people know what to do. Well, you've I, got I don't to think they know what to do. You know, I, mean, I don't think people well, want to strike out futilely. They just don't know what to do. Well, you, well, well and, and that's another point. Such ignorant people, man. Such passive, ignorant, cowardly, simple, dumbstruck, propagandized people. If they don't know what to do, then God help them. They've had numerous examples, and... And you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. That's that's it in a nutshell. And if they don't know what to do at this point, as as their houses are being taken from them, as their jobs are being taken from them, as, as they're being robbed blind, as they're being lied to up, down, and sideways, if they can't connect the dots, if they can't figure it out, God bless them, I can, and I've left. They're on their own. What can well, – Figure it out. Figure it out. Figured out. If after all of that you can't figure it out, you can't connect the dots. I'm speechless. What you you can't say anything to people like this. What could I possibly say to people that would get through to them? What are some of the things they can do? What is what are some of the Wait, things? Well, didn't they can I just didn't, didn't I just give you an example? You got to go to the place where these crimes are occurring, and you got to go over the fence, and you got to say hell no. You got to walk through the front door, and you got to say, "Hell no, not with my money, not with my life, not in my country, et cetera, et cetera." Do what I did. Stand up. Be a man. Be a woman. Find your voice. You have one. Find it. You have two feet. Find them and stand up on them. If you're not willing to stand up and be counted, if you're not willing to speak out, then fine. Go in your house, lock the door, shut the blinds, and wait for the end. It won't be long in coming. Well, I know that on your, I think it's on your uh, Event Horizon um, blog spot that you uh, actually give some other examples, such as pulling their money out of out of Wall Street. Um, well, it's in my Minot, my, Minot Manifesto, which is on uh, my uh, my blog. Right, website. that's exactly right, yeah. Um, it's not paying their debts, event, you, you know. EventHorizonChronicle.blogspot.com, and I, I issued that in... On, on uh, April 15th of last year, over a year ago, uh, to the press, it was almost ignored. People assumed I couldn't be serious. Oh, yes, yeah, serious as a heart attack, serious enough to go over to the to the nuclear missile silos, serious enough to go to jail, serious enough to be put on trial in federal court, uh, serious enough for the FBI to confiscate most of my worldly possessions. Uh, I put everything on the line, my safety, my personal liberty, my worldly possessions, most of them, as meager as they were, I put everything on the line. I put myself way out there. And I'm telling you clearly, unless a lot of other people, I mean millions of other pe- 
people start putting themselves way out there, you're going to be a slave. So just adjust to it. And if you want to be a slave, fine. Like I said, go in your house, shut the door, draw the blinds, and wait for the end. It won't be long in coming. There's um, we have a call. Let's let's see. Uh, we have one of our callers on the line. One of our frequent callers. Um, give me a second here. I'll pull him up. Uh, let's get that out of there. Um, one more minute. Hey, Will, how are you? I'm doing pretty good. That's uh, great. I'd like to address uh, a question to uh, Dr. Sauter. Sure. In regards to all these underground bases and the underwater bases, uh, I'm just trying to. I'm just trying to guess why would all these different countries uh, manufacture all these bases? Do they see that something is coming and that these bases are basically for mostly the elite the elite class to hide when something big is coming? And one other question. Does he know anything about the stories that the about the Nazis had developed a base down in Antarctica. And I'll take my answer offline. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you. yeah I, um, I'll address the last question first. Um, yeah, my research has shown the Nazis definitely had an interest in the Antarctic. Hello? Yeah, that's okay. I, I think he's still there. He took the he just hung out. Yes, well, there was uh, some muffled sound on the line. But I am... Um, I, I'll answer the, the last question first. The Nazis did have a strong interest in the Antarctic. They explored a region that they called Neuschwedenland, and there is evidence showing that during the war and also right after World War II, um, the Nazis had a U-boat presence um, down in the South Atlantic, all the way down in the region of the sub-Antarctic waters. So, for me, I accept that the Nazis did do something down there. I also find the high jump um, project that the uh, United States Navy uh, uh, got underway about a year and a half after the end of World War II. The United States Navy sent a major uh, naval task force to the Antarctic with Admiral Byrd in command. Um, there was a lot of speculation since that this task force, naval task force, went down there to fight um, the Nazis in the Antarctic. I don't know if that's true or not, but if it is, I think the Nazis, if indeed they were down there, got the better hand because the U.S. Navy pulled its task force out of Antarctic waters earlier than it had planned to do. So I would give a qualified yes uh, or conditional yes to that last question. I do think uh, there probably is a Nazi base down there, and it probably is still operational. I think the Antarctic is an area of very high strangeness, and I strongly surmise there are multiple undersea and underground bases in the Antarctic region, um, very highly funded, extremely secret, very high tech. As to the first question, Yes, the United States clearly is by far and away the leader in underground base construction, but it's certainly not the only country in the world that has made secret underground facilities. Many other countries have, the Japanese, the Chinese, the Saudis, the Israelis, um, you know, uh, the English, um, the Germans, uh, the Americans, the, the Canadians. Many countries have done this. Um, and yes, I, the ruling elite do think something is coming. And, and I will say, in fact, something definitely is coming. And some of these bases absolutely are designed as so-called arcs, uh, places of refuge for them to ride out uh, periods of great turmoil, cataclysm, and trouble. Um, and yes, it is not for the general, these places are not for the general public. If you don't have an access card, if you haven't been invited, if you would not be recognized by name and by face at your local secret underground base or underwater base, then you may safely assume you won't be going in when the sloppy stuff hits the big fan. So, yeah, um, these facilities are not intended for one and all. 
they are definitely uh, by invitation only. And if you are not invited, guess what? You will not be going in. Okay, Will, there's your answer. Um, Richard, I, I just want to take a minute, if you don't mind. I want to just quickly read, um, you got a couple of bullet points here from the, um, I think it's the Minot uh, uh, Manifesto as to what people can do. Um, and, and I know that not everybody's willing to certainly jump the fence to the, you know, nuclear missile compound, and, and, and they're not burst enough even in rituals to, to be able to do anything like that. Well, most, most people, I'm talking about the people that I see walking down the street, but there are other things that people can do. They can pull their money out of the big banks. They can pull their money out of Wall Street. They can, they can, not, they can stop paying their taxes. Um, they can reduce their consumption of goods and services from Fortune 500 companies or simplify the material lifestyle, um, not go to war for the Pentagon, boycott corporate let's propaganda. Let's repeat, let's, repeat that, let's repeat that point. Don't go to war. Don't fight the wars for the Pentagon. Discourage your children for, from going and fighting for the Pentagon, whether it's in the Pentagon's regular uniform services or in one of these um, – one of these mercenary outfits like Blackwater, or now they've named it XE, I think, um, and there are a number of these other others, don't go to other countries and kill people. It's not polite, for one thing. It's not moral, for another. You and you wouldn't, like, you wouldn't like someone to come to your country and kill you. Therefore, do not go to their country and kill them. Does this even need to be said, David? You know, for you and me, no. But apparently for a lot of people, yes. So because, a they're lot dumber of people, than a, yes. because they're dumber than a post. This is what I'm telling you, dumber than a post. They would be incensed if someone came into their neighborhood and, and drove up and down the street with a machine gun killing people. And yet they will send their children into the not the United States Army to go to other countries and do that very thing and then wonder why don't they like us? I wonder why not. Well, you know, again, I wonder why they don't like us. And this comes back again to something that I think you probably touched on in your Kundalini book, and that's about mind control and programming. Um, people Bingo. are. They're, they're, the, the programming, the programming is, is extensive. It's like, it's, like it's, 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 as if, it's as if, you know what? If you have a United States flag on your shoulder, you can blow away anyone you want to, and it's okay. Not only is it okay, it's good because you're doing it for the USA. However, if someone else blows you away, then that's bad. You know why? Because you're from the USA. Have you ever heard anything more stupid in your entire life? And yet, that is philosophy. I just described tens of millions of people who have yes, precisely that philosophy, and well, yet look, it is that they are dumber than a post, and so stupid that they cannot even famine the depth of their stupidity. Well, unfortunately, it's a shame that they really are that ignorant, and ignorance is not an excuse. Ignorance, as a matter of fact, pretty much becomes an evil, actually, in the light of what it allows. Um, it there, there are a couple of other things. I just want to run these other points down, and then we're going to move on to something else quickly. But you said boycott corporate propaganda and news services such as ABC, CBS, Fox, uh, CNN, MSNBC, Washington Post, New York Times, Wall Street Journal. That includes, um, you know, um, uh, the, the, all the other papers that are pretty much out there, the main papers. Patronize or establish your own alternative sources and networks. Um, as many as are able, engage in creative nonviolence. Acts of civil disobedience at corporate creative governmental. Nonviolence. Yes, do you, creative you know nonviolence. Do you, do, you, do you know something? I am I am just amazed. Um, I, I'm Caucasian. I'm of the a European American persuasion. Let's put it that way. And I remember I grew up in the South. I'm a native Virginian, and I spent a large portion of my life in the South. And in Virginia and Georgia and Florida, Louisiana, Texas. I've lived, worked, studied, and traveled all across the South, Arkansas as well. And so I know the South very well. I am a Southerner. And in the 50s and 60s, black people, not every black person, of course, but many black people, displayed tremendous courage in the so-called civil rights movement. And they did just that. They stood up. They used their feet. 
They used their voices, and they essentially said, you know what? We disagree with what's happening here, and we're not going to go along to get along. We're not, we're not going to permit up, permit, uh, put up with business as usual anymore. We are going to sit in. We are going to walk in. We are going to violate the law. Let me repeat that. We are going to violate the law mm -hmm. because the law itself is unlawful. Mm -hmm. We are going to break the law because the law must be broken. The law itself is illegal. And we're we going to violate it. By the thousands and tens and hundreds of thousands, we're going to consciously, publicly violate the law mm -hmm. with television cameras running. I'm telling you, white people are so weak, man. What can I say? So weak. Their pockets are being picked, and they just take it. Even worse, they say, can I send you some more? Don't hit me. Can I send you more? I've never, I've never seen anything like it in my life. Well, you know, I think it was, and I'm paraphrasing Martin Luther King Jr., who said that we had a moral, re a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. And well, and, and pick your law. I mean, the, the, the United States is just bursting with unjust laws. I mean, from A to Z. Pick your unjust law yeah, and yeah. publicly violate it. Publicly violate it, or else you're going to be a slave. Or else you're going to be a slave, and your children will be your children will be even more enslaved. So, well, well, I, yeah, go ahead. What I have to say to the American people is, you better find some courage from somewhere. You know, you better be like that, like the Tin Man, is it, who doesn't have a heart, but he wishes he he wishes he had one. If if you can't find the courage or the heart to do it, pretend you've got courage. And mm -hmm. in the, in the process of pretending like you have courage, you'll start to act like you do, and one day you realize that you are manifesting courage. You know, the most courageous people act not because they're they don't have fear; they act in spite of their fear. That's the only difference. That brings to mind a quote, actually, from uh, that I, I actually got off of your blog spot as well. Here I stand. I cannot do otherwise. And I think well, that's, that that's, from Martin, that's from Martin Luther, uh, the, the father of the, of the Protestant Reformation from mm -hmm. centuries ago in Germany. Mm -hmm. He went to the cathedral door, I believe it was in Mainz, Germany, mm -hmm. and he listed his, his – um, he had a whole – literally a, a list of long grievances grievances with the Roman Catholic Church and the Pope, and he nailed them to the cathedral door and essentially said, you know what, this whole doctrine of the infallible papacy and these practices you're promoting, uh, I can't go along with it. I disagree. I'm not going to stay in my house with the shutters drawn and the, lower, you know, the, the door locked. I'm going to come out here wherever, where one and all can see me. I'm going to go, go downtown to the cathedral door. I'm going to nail this list to the door with my name written in block letters at the bottom. If you don't like it, come and get me and know where to find me. Well, I think that when people get to that point, and, 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 I, and I personally do believe they will. I mean, whether they it, better. I mean, I'm, I'm, watching, I'm watching, you know, as I said earlier at the top of the show, you know, I'm watching the residents of Cedar Falls, Iowa, and I'm watching them really stand up for themselves. They didn't succeed so far, but they are standing up for themselves. And I'm getting the feeling that they are not going to take um, things lying down. Um, and, well, and I think this is beginning to spread. The American government does not mean well. Anyone, anyone who still believes in the benevolence of the USA government is naive. Let's just leave, leave it at that. Supremely That's not naive. Now let's, let's talk a little bit. Mean well. Let's talk a little bit about the global economic crisis in our last few minutes. What do you have to tell yes. us about that? Yes, it's serious, and it's going to become more serious. We've seen tremendous riots and demonstrations in in Greece, in Athens, in Madrid, in Spain. Um, the English this coming week or the week after, I believe, have the largest um, labor strike by organized labor in a century. Well, planned in Great Britain. Um, the Irish have been demonstrating and pro protesting. The Egyptians closed down Cairo for weeks. For mm -hmm. weeks on end, they closed down the whole city. 
Mm-hmm. Um, there are protests and demonstrations ongoing in Yemen, in Syria, in Jordan, in Morocco, um, all over the, the Arab world. And it's because, in many cases, of the underlying economic reality. Uh, this plus present debt-based, central bank-based, warfare-based economic model is destructive, it's exploitive, it promotes um, servitude, slavery, and poverty. It produces that with a certainty. It can't be otherwise. It splits society into the great exploited, impoverished masses and the very few, few greatly enriched elites who lord it over everyone else. That's the way it's set up. That's the way it's designed. That is what it has done and is doing. And all across the world, people by the millions are more or less simultaneously waking up to that reality. Um, the situation will either get better or or will get worse. The only way it will get better is when the people, as one, stand up and say, hell no, I'm not your slave. The debt that you shackled me with is unjust and illegal, and I renounce it because I'm, you know, the only way for a slave to be free is to run away. The master will never voluntarily let the slaves go. Why should he? Right. He's got the best of all possible worlds. Slavery only ends when the slaves say, this much and no more. I'm mm-hmm. not your slave. I'm, mm-hmm. Let's repeat this. I am not your slave. Back off. Mm-hmm. Only then does it end. Mm-hmm. So only when the American people say, you know what, Federal Reserve Bank, I'm not your slave. Back off. Get lost. Only when the American people say, you know what, Pentagon, I'm not your sla- slave. Hands off my boy. Hands off my girl. They're not going to go to the other side of the planet and do, do your filthy murdering for you. So get the hell out of my house and get your military recruiters out of my local high, high school. Only then will this insanity end. That is that would be a wonderful thing to see. I can't wait to see it myself. Um, a, a, you know, a, it would have to be a, again in a nonviolent way, though. I think because obviously well, it has to be. It has yeah. to be nonviolent because violence is the problem. And this was the example that Dr. King gave, and it was a wonderful example that uh, the Black Civil Rights Movement gave. Um, is that through creative nonviolence, you can achieve tremendous change in society. You can you can turn a society upside down with nonviolent creative methods. Violence is the problem. Nonviolence is the antidote. Creative nonviolence is the solution. And when people understand that, creative nonviolence says, "No, I'm not going to go do your filthy, bloody murdering for you. I just won't. And keep your hands off my children. Get out of my house. Get out of my high school." Take your military recruiters and vanish from our lives. That's nonviolent. They they come soliciting violence. They come trying to sign you up to go commit murder. Yep. It's only when you it's only when you say no. And by the way, hell no, I won't go. And by by the way, get out of my house and get out of my local schools and leave your hands off my children. That's when it ends. Well, we make I- it end. From your, mouth to, from your mouth to the ears of, of, of the majority of the American public. We have about five more minutes, and I want to talk about a couple of other things quickly. Yes. Um, you, you had a vision quest when you went down to, to yes. um, South America. Uh, tell yes. us about that. I believe it was the uh, ISU. I can't even say the name. Ayahuasca. Yes. Ayahuasca. 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 Ayahuasca vision quest. Tell us about that. Ayahuasca is a brew uh, that you drink. It's made from the um, two plants that grow in the forest. One is a bushy plant covered with leaves. The other is a vine that, that climbs up in the trees. And the, um, the, the stem of the vine is taken and mashed up, and the leaves of the other plants are taken and mixed together. And this is boiled to create a brew that you then drink which is uh, so bad tasting, quite a, quite a few people vomit when they drink it. 
But these plants are hyperconscious. They're actually aware. And I know that in our Western culture, we are taught that plants don't think. Plants are unaware. They're not conscious. On the contrary, plants do think. They are aware. They are conscious. And some plants not only are conscious, aware, and do think, but they are more conscious, more aware, and think far more deeply than by far the vast majority of human beings ever have. And when you drink this brew, this plant-based brew, um, the plants communicate with you directly on a mental and spiritual level and uh, transfer quite a lot of understanding and information directly to your mind. It's, it's from one consciousness to another. What, what I was shown by ayahuasca is that there is something analogous to a machine. It's what I call the machine. It's a vast, um, artificially intelligent entity, uh, which is at least planetary in scope. It may extend beyond the planet Earth, but it for sure encompasses the planet Earth, both at a physical level and also at a spiritual level in the astral realm, which is, which is the next highest spiritual level away from this physical realm. And this, this machine has a conscious presence in both of these areas. Uh, it seeks to vanquish the human race, to enslave us, to control us, to dominate us. In fact, I perceive that it wants to destroy the human race and biological life on this planet and is well advanced in its agenda. It is behind the Pentagon. It's behind the corrupt Fortune 500 agencies. It's behind these corrupt big banks and multilateral international banking institutions that are strangling the human race in this planet with their debt-based uh, currency schemes, uh, such as the so-called United States dollar, which is a Ponzi scheme and only comes into creation because it is lent at interest and so is a debt-based instrument. This machine, so-called, does not have a soul or a spirit, but it uses other entities or beings who do have souls and spirits. It understands that human beings, or at least a lot of them, have spirits and souls. It understands that it does not have a spirit and a soul, but nonetheless, it uses these beings to its purpose, either with their consent and understanding or without it, either, either, either with their voluntary cooperation or, if necessary, against their will, either with their full knowledge or, 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 if necessary, unknowing. But it is a dark, evil force behind these very destructive and ex exploitive events which we see taking place on our, on our planet and that are so heavily impacting the human race at this time in history. Uh, the machine will not stop coming. The only way to thwart the machine is through a massive planetary up Wising, U P W I S I N G, and upwising, a creatively nonviolent upwising as as opposed to a violent upwising. I'm I, we're going to have to 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 wind everything up on there, but I want to also add to that um, a quote that I also got from 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 you at some point, either through another interview or through your writing, that love heals all life. And I think that's if people exactly. can get into exactly what that means, and I don't mean the namby-pamby romantic love that people see up on the big screen, but the deeper love that comes, first of all, from a true understanding of oneself, I think we might actually be able to find a way out of all of this. But you, we, that, I, I don't see any other way but through that. Do you love yourself? Do you love the planet? Do you love your children? Then you act with great courageous love. Okay, so that, folks, is Dr. Richard Souter. Uh, Richard, thank you again for being on the show, for all the things that you had to share with people, for trying to, to shake people out of their complacency. Um, and I want to thank everybody that tuned in um, to The Bright Side today. It's a moot, moot issue anyway because they don't ask me. So since they don't ask me, I won't be attending anywhere. Um, anyway, anywhere, uh, I do... Uh, give many interviews um, when and if people ask, and I want to thank you for asking me for an interview. I'm delighted to be here.
Not a problem. I mean, I, I'm certainly familiar with, with uh, some of your work, at least, and I personally feel, and, and I think the producer does as well, that, you know, it's just important to get as much information out there to people as possible. There's so few avenues for people to really hear um, what's going on, and, and admittedly, most people really will probably pay half an ear, but, you know, maybe just if a little information falls on the wayside and, and it goes in and it, it stays there, maybe somewhere down the road something will happen that will corroborate that and they'll begin to put something together for themselves, you know. Um, uh, some, of, some of them will, some of them will, David, but frankly, there's a very large percentage of the American people. I couldn't give you a precise figure other than to say millions and millions and millions who are walking into the events that are coming like uh, as if they were walking forehead first into a, a giant rapidly rotating buzz saw at a lumber yard. They are so unaware, so unconscious, so propagandized, and many of them very smugly and happily so, that they will get the rudest awakening that they could have ever made, imagined. Now, it wouldn't need to be so. People are unconscious, propagandized, and unaware because at every turn they have elected not to awaken, they have elected not to see, they have decided not to understand, they have made a conscious decision not to pursue understanding. In fact, many people have, have assiduously avoided being aware and being conscious. However, we are reaching the point where events will force themselves on people, on pe into people's awareness, whether or not they like it, whether or not they feel they are ready. The very fact that they have refused to be ready, that they have refused to be aware, will bring these events in turn, uh, has altered the climate. And, and my understanding is that um, there are going to there's going to be hell to pay, um, not only for the for the marine ecology, which is already reeling. Forget what BP says. Forget what the uh, USA government federal agencies say. They're liars. They're all headed straight to hell. They're just psychopathic liars from hell. So forget what they say or don't say, because because they wouldn't know the truth mm -hmm. if it came up to them and bit them on the nose. Mm -hmm. The truth is not in them. But w w the reality is that this has affected hydrology and, and through the hy hydrology, the climate, it's affected the marine life, the, the, you know, uh, the, the, the cork is off of, of the bottle, uh, this, the genie is out, the lid of Pandora's box is open, and uh, what is broken cannot and will not be fixed. So that situation will be festering for years, decades, maybe centuries to come. Well, you know, I mean, I certainly, when it first happened, I mean, I was, I almost got sick to my stomach and I got so angry. I was furious um, because I could just sense that uh, this was a major uh, shift, a major turn in, of events uh, for this country in, in many, many ways. And now, you know, I'm, you know, after a while, you, you know, everybody, everybody turns their back and goes back to their work and, and you just. You, you, you kind of forget about it. You know, I feel a little badly even for, for the, from my perspective because at some point there's, there's so many other things that, that start happening around the world. It's like, well, where do you, uh, you know, you, you can't focus on one thing but for so long before something else gets, you know, gets somebody's, it gets one's attention. Yes, and that, that was uh, the so-called British Petroleum accident last spring was not really an accident, and that has to be understood. British Petroleum knew well before the rig blew out that there was a high probability that it would. They knew that the pressures down there were phenomenally high. They knew that they were drilling into an extremely high pressure, very gassy um, petroleum uh, uh, stratum. And they were warned by their own engineers that uh, a catastrophic blowout was more than likely if they continued. And yet they continued to the point where it did front and sent in their lives and they will be confronted with what they ha have gone out of their way to not see, to not understand for decades. Well, you know, I think there's a lot of truth in that. And 
I know, for instance, a friend of mine was telling me we were having a discussion somewhat about this the other day, and he was saying that a member of his family, his brother, said to him, well, you know, America, you know, love it or leave it. If you don't like it, leave it. So well, left um, it. you left it. Well, I left it. Yeah, I got to the point where, you know, one too many persons said that to me. Well, why are you here? If you don't like America, why are you here anyway? And, you know, I thought to myself, yeah, why the hell am I here? I think I'll leave because I'm really sick and tired of that of that opinion. And, by the way, those people who love America so much are about to find out exactly what America really is and has been for a long time because America is getting ready to bear its fangs. Well, you know, I had a friend of mine say to me, too, also, he said, well, you know, if my president says it is good enough for me, I'm not friends with that person anymore, by the way, because I I couldn't wrap my mind around that particular perspective. Um, I think people are beginning to wake up a little bit, though. I mean, the Gulf, the Gulf, I'm going to say the Gulf War, but the, uh, the, the Gulf of Mexico and everything that happened down there over the last year, um, we don't hear a lot about it on the news anymore. Uh, and we never really heard a lot of the, what was really going on. Um, but people really began to speak out a little bit down there. Um, and they probably still are. We just don't really hear about it. No, the mainstream news media have gone silent for the most part on the on the problems in the Gulf of Mexico, which are ongoing. They are extremely severe. They are absolutely hazardous to human life, to marine uh, marine organisms across the board, from the you know from the plankton all up all the way up to the whales and the porpoises and every stage in between. Um, it is it is it's damaged the hydrology of the Gulf of Mexico. The the corexit chemicals that have been sprayed in the water, the petroleum itself, uh, have altered the the chemical nature of the water such that the Gulf current does not flow the same way that it has for essentially many thousands of years. That has created um, a catastrophic change in hydrology of the Gulf of Mexico and the North Atlantic. That. His writings and interviews have appeared in magazines such as Nexus, UFO Magazine, Atlantis Rising, UFO Universe, uh, Dossier Sucre d'Etat, and on many websites such as Sotnet and Rents.com, to name a few. His five books include Underground Bases and Tunnels, What is the Government Trying to Hide, Kundalini Tales, Underwater and Underground Bases, Hidden in Plain Sight, Beyond the X-Files, and The Sauda Report, Notes from the Underground. And, folks, I want to remind you, of course, that we have a call-in session. Uh, we're going to talk for an hour, and then after that, I'm sure there's going to be some questions that you may have yourself or some comments that you have for, for Richard. And if you want to feel, please feel free to call in. The number is there. Uh, it's 877-572-4270. All right. Uh, Dr. Souter, I can call you Richard, right? Absolutely. Welcome to the show. How are you? Well, thank you very much. I'm doing fine. I'm enjoying a wonderful evening here on the west coast of South America. I took a, a long walk on the beach earlier this afternoon and just looked at the surf, felt the sand in my feet, and reflected on the state of this planet and human race. Well, you're from, um, uh, you started off in Virginia, and then you were living in Texas for a while. How did you end up down where you are right now? Well, it's been a, a long journey, more than half a century. I was born in 1955 in Virginia and spent the first 20 years or so of my life, uh, most of the first 20 years of my life in Virginia. And since then, I've, I've lived, worked, studied, and traveled in many different states in the USA and also in um, many different countries and other parts of the world. Uh, I guess for a number for a number of years I was thinking about um, expatriating or leaving the United States. As time went by, I felt less and less comfortable in the country. I agreed less and less with so many of policies of the government, both domestic and foreign. I found I seemed to have less and less in common with um, more and more people in the country, and it got to the point 
point where I questioned why I remained. And so the day arrived when I decided to relocate to South America, initially for a vision quest. And indeed, I did have some visions in the process of undertaking my vision quest and many deep realizations which continue to this day. But I would say about three weeks into that process, after I arrived in South Amer America, I awoke one morning and uh, realized I'm not returning to the USA. I'm going to stay in South America. That's what I did uh, half a year ago, uh, more than half a year ago, and I feel very comfortable with that decision. Does it, is it, has it made a difference on you to be there in that perhaps you don't feel quite as close and upfront to some of the policies and that you find offensive happening in, in this country? Yes, yes. I, I reached the point where I didn't even want to lend the appearance of support to what you might call the United States of America by my physical presence in that country. So I voted with my feet or maybe voted with my airline ticket would be another a better way to say it. And I I got out of there. I scrammed. I um, just can't support the United States anymore. I disagree with the policies of the government. I find a very large percentage of the population are um, uh, essentially clueless, uh, bizarrely unconscious. Mm. And I, I reached the point where I no longer desired to associate with that type of person. And by the same token, I no longer wanted to lend even the appearance of support for the United States government by remaining in its territory. Are you still – are you – Touring or lecturing or, or going to conferences and stuff from where you no, from where no, you are? You know, no, you know I am very rarely invited to conferences, and were I be to uh, were were I to be invited to speak at a conference in the United States of America or in, in any territory that it controlled, um, I would not attend. Um, I, but no, I'm 